My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I've spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the DTD Podcast. This week in the studio, Dr. Tony Brooks. He's now a chiropractor who grew up in Roseville, California. He excelled in the classroom and athletics, but suffered a setback his senior year when he tore his right ACL in a pickup basketball game. After high school, he enrolled at the University of Arizona, where during his first month of college, the attacks of 9-11 happened. While still in college, Tony saw that Pat Tillman had enlisted in the United States Army, foregoing a huge contract extension with the Arizona Cardinals to become a U.S. Army Ranger. So in 2003, he enlisted as an 11 Bravo with an option 40 to become a Ranger himself. Fast forward to 2005, and as a member of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, he was tasked with the recovery of Turbine 33, 16 operators that were aboard, and the four-man SEAL recon team that Marcus Luttrell, the lone survivor, was a part of. The mission was initially slated to last only 12 hours, but ended up stretching for almost three days. Tonight, we hear the story from one ranger about all rangers who put it on the line for the United States day after day after day. Tonight, joining me in the studio, Dr. Tony Brooks. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and to be chatting with you today. Yeah, I'm so happy that you're here. So I've poured myself my proverbial beer. I've sat down at the table and I'm ready to hear your story. I enjoy telling this story because, you know, ultimately I am just a part of the story and there were a bunch of amazing, amazing people there with me. So I feel like I'm telling part of their story too. Well, you know, I'm glad you're here and I'm, I'm glad you're telling this story because a, a lot of combat stories that you hear are just about the blood and guts. And I know a lot of people don't like talking about that all the time. Yours was actually a book about kind of self-discovery, figuring out what you really thought that you knew about war and what you really did know about war and what you kind of knew about yourself. But I want to start out in the past and as you're growing up, you grew up in a pretty good life. I mean, not really a military family. You had both grandfathers that were Korean war veterans, but you grew up in a, in a pretty good life and not really that much military background. So you're excelling in school. You're doing well in sports. You're headed towards college. So let's talk about it. What, what was you looking at while you were in high school? Yeah. When I was in high school, I think ultimately the goal was always to go to college and you know, I felt like that was my path at the time. And I didn't really know where I wanted to go. And I kind of visited some colleges. And ultimately, the, the desert drew me in. Uh, ironically, the desert drew me in. And I just, I felt at home there. So that's how I ended up in at the University of Arizona. And of course, you know, the strategically placed uh, beautiful young ladies on my campus tour also did not hurt. Well, that seems kind of a, a tagline of your whole story through life up until uh, about 10 or 11 years ago uh, is the beautiful ladies kind of uh, led you in the right direction. Now, while you were at the University <laughs> of Arizona in Tucson, I was actually stationed at Huachuca. So when 9-11 happened, okay. I was there and I had just gotten back from a surgery in Washington, D.C. And I had to be back at Bethesda to do a checkup on my surgery that next Friday. So we were in the same area at the same time and, and everything kind of went on high alert there. Um, with your family, did they have any idea about this? I'm, I, I know that they were pretty supportive, but did they have any idea that after this happened that you started getting kind of these uh, thoughts about what you wanted to do? Um, I don't think they ever crossed their mind that it was a possibility, to be honest. But, you know, right after 9-11, I actually called my dad and had that conversation with him and told him, you know, that, that was my kind of my gut reaction was to to go and fight. And he he really talked me down and and tried to 
get me to think more rationally because my initial reaction was I'm going to fight, uh, which is very rare for me. But he basically said, listen, if this is what you want to do, you can go do it. But here's what I think you should do. I think you should finish your first year of college and then make that decision. But leaving right now is going to cost you a lot of time and money and you should really think about it. And so, you know, it's funny that you say um, that fighting wasn't a big thing with you or that it didn't happen a lot because you're self-described in this book as kind of a, a nerd or a geek or, you know, that you were good at sports, but you mostly excelled in the classroom. But it's a weird dichotomy of you that, that you excelled kind of in both. I mean, even though you got hurt and that was mostly just trying to be the best when you got hurt playing basketball, that's how you actually, you know, uh, ended up. But I, I had watched an interview with you before and you had talked about that even though you excelled at sports and things like that, that you were very emotional when you played sports. And if you didn't win or if you couldn't do what you wanted to do, can you kind of give me that background? Cause I think by reading the book, it went forward into your military career. Yeah. I mean, looking back on it, I find it hilarious. And it's like, damn, you were, you were such a little crybaby when you played little league. <laughs> like when I would strike out, I would be so angry I would throw my helmet, my bat, you know, I, I, I would actually squirt out tears and, and that's how much I hated losing. And I just remember one of the teams I was on in little league, they were last place. I mean, it was horrible. I was one of the better players on the team. And when I failed, I knew I was letting everybody down because they basically, they expected me to be the best player. And. So I, you know, that's, that's definitely something that's continued throughout my life. I wouldn't say that I'm a crybaby, but I'm, I'm definitely one that strives <laughs> to always do my best. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's how, it, that's how it went down in little league, uh, the big whiny one. <laughs> so with this, your brother, now th this was another interesting thing about your childhood to me. Your brother was the military historian and a real fan of the Rangers, um, but you don't mention anything in there, so I'm not sure. Was he in military service too? Did he ever go to military service? Yeah, so this is a very sore subject for him because okay. he actually followed me. He followed me with an 11 Bravo contract with an op Ranger option, so the option 40 contract. And it was only, I was, I had just finished basic training and he was like a month behind me. Um, he got through all of basic training and you know he finished the field training exercise that all the infantrymen do and basically from there on out you just exist in, to, in order to graduate well of course infantrymen being what infantrymen do they are messing around and the drill sergeant you know returned and popped smoke on him and he said you know what you guys want to mess around all right you guys are still in basic training so do some push-ups and he was smoking them for a while and on one of the exercises you know on your belly, on your feet, on your belly, on your feet. Well, he goes to go to his belly and his right shoulder. Um, he described it as exploding. He said, everything just exploded in my right shoulder. And this is a, again, very similar to me. He had a surgically repaired right shoulder uh, before entering service. So he knew exactly what it was. And after that, the military is like, we don't want these damaged goods. Yeah, you're done. So that was pretty devastating for him because he's he's much tougher than me. Um, he's faster. He's stronger. Um, he he would have made it to the 75th. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, we were constantly competing our whole lives. But yeah, he was he was going to follow me to to Ranger Battalion, and got a bad break. Literally. Uh, so. Yeah. Whenever you talk about it, though, I mean, you were damaged goods when you came in, too. You had had that surgery. You had had that rehab. So I'm sure that is is it a sore subject between you two or just kind of a sore subject with him? Uh, just with him. Between us, we're, we're fine. I mean, I think uh, he lived partially through my service. Uh, knowing what I was doing is what he wanted to do. So he was always a big support and. He was always there. 
He was always he's still happy about it. Now, let me ask you, when you go to take your top 10 percent of your high school class, you're you you know, you go to college or a business major. You want to maybe even do geology and stuff when you go take the ASFAB and then you tell them you want 11 Bravo. Do they look at you strange? Do they anything like that? Or are they like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, my my recruiter, uh, he was an infantryman and in the nicest way possible, which this isn't normal for a recruiter to do this, but he basically looked me in the eyes and said, wait a minute, you want to be an infantryman? <laughs> Hold on. He goes, you know, you can do any job. You can, you can pick anything you want. You know, you know, you can fly helicopters. You can do the drone stuff. You can like shoot missiles at people. <laughs> you can do anything like naming all these but jobs. be an infantryman. And he's like, so you want to be an infantryman? He's like, all right. I mean, that's what they want us to recruit for. So I'm cool with that. But I mean, are you sure? <laughs> I, and I think that was his way of saying, you know, you're, you're a little nerdy, I think, for this. Like, I don't think you're cut out for it. And what, Ranger? Are you sure? Are you really sure? <laughs> so that's how that went at the recruiter. It was pretty funny. And, and so you told him, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do this. Uh, I want to be an airborne ranger. Um, when you get to basic, I, I loved when I went to basic, uh, for my first job in the military, I was a Ford observer. So I go to basic, uh, I'm 17 years old. I'm in between my junior and senior year. I did that split op thing. Um, I had a, I had a blast when I went, um, I, and I know it sounds crazy. Now, don't get me wrong. There were parts of it that sucked, but I had a really good time and it kind of helped me focus because I stayed in the National Guard after I did that. And I went to college for a year and found out that it, it really wasn't for me. I didn't I didn't do bad, but I didn't do good either. I went active duty. And when I got done with my active service and went back to college, I did way better. I, I made way better grades. I was more focused. And we'll talk about that a little later with you. But was that your whole thought? as you're leaving college, like, Hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to do this active service. I'm going to do what I can to help, you know, what my country needs right now. And then I'm going to get back into college and, and finish out the career that I had chosen. Yeah. That, for me, that was always the plan was this was, you know, something I had to do, but it, I never looked at it as a career. Um, but I'll, I'll give you this is when I did get out and to this day, there's still part of me that's like, man, I should have should have stayed in. There's so much I could have done. There's so much to do in the military. But uh, ultimately, I knew that I probably wouldn't have been super happy. Um, you're challenged in different ways in the military than you are, like in my profession currently. And I need um, more intellectual challenging versus like physical. Um, just the way I'm built, but you know, I, I, I look back and I, I definitely regret leaving <laughs> as weird as that sounds, even though I love where I'm at now, there's no, still no, always no. that part of you that looks back and goes, man, I could have done more. Yeah. Do you ever think that there might have been a job though in the military that gave you more of that intellectual, uh, stimulus, even if we're talking about other maybe special operations careers that you could have gone into, uh, more of a thinking man's game, uh, special forces, especially thinking outside the box and, and how they work and stuff. But do you still think, even if you would have done that, you probably wouldn't have been happy all the way through your career? No, I think looking back now, now that I'm more uh, mature and educated on other things in the military, I think yeah, absolutely. There's so many professions I could have gone into. I just didn't see the path at that time. You know, I was, I was a young, you know, tabbed corporal ranger that, you know, had a fire team that I, my path was, you know, you, you're, you take over a fire team, you become a squad leader, uh, possibly a platoon sergeant in the regiment. And then from there, you, you either go to, you know, tier one spec ops, or you do go to, you go to the green berets or, you know, jobs at the Pentagon. There's plenty of things you can do. Uh, I just, that path to me didn't seem very clear and 
college seemed very cut and dry. Like you get your degree, you do your job. Yeah. And I think that's a way a lot of guys maybe think, uh, in the military is unless they were, you know, from five years old. And I've talked to a lot of guys that were like eight years old and knew that's what they wanted to do for their entire life. That's what they always wanted to be. That's what they were going to be. All those things. Um, the guys go in and, and even me, you know, you look back on it and you're not quite sure what that past going to be for 20 whole years. But when you look at it now being older, 20 years is not really that long. I mean, nothing. I, I was talking to a guy a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about when you're, you know, a, a corporal or a, you know, a sergeant or really even a private. And you look at these guys that are sergeant majors, colonels, and you're like, man, those guys are ancient. And they're really not. They're like 40 years old, you know, 41 years old. They're not old at all. Um, I, I just think that a lot of people don't have that future foresight. And it's so funny that when they get out, they start getting that that future look in their eye. And they're like, wow, I could have done this. I could have done that. And it's always interesting how they end up because I think all of those guys that think that way carry a piece of the military with them outside in the uh, civilian world. Absolutely. I, I use everything I learned in as a private in the 75th Ranger Regiment almost daily. I mean, from from the simple things of the time I wake up on in the morning to my routines, how strict I am with my routines, things like that. That's all stuff I learned in the military. Um, how I approach every single challenge I have in life is basically a military strategy viewpoint. It, it never leaves you for certain. Yeah, that that's for sure. Now, before we get fully into the military career, there was a really interesting... I. I think it was one of the most interesting parts of the book to me. I want to talk about your grandfather uh, and I want to talk about both grandfathers, but the first one I want to talk about, I want to read a quote out of the book. It says, I knew little of death though. The one loss that had stuck with me had been a grandfather who I had admired uh, greatly. His passing hit me hard, a sucker punch to the soul. And it was interesting to me that we're talking about when you get to Afghanistan and you're you you're initially kind of seeing the mission that that portrayed out in the entire book. And you think back to that death. Um, why did you compare the two so much? You know, I, I don't know why that happened to. To be the connection for me, and I think everyone has their own ways of. Uh, taking something super dramatic or traumatic and combining them to to min either minimize it or to make it more relatable. But for me, I think uh, my grandfather's passing, the one I was referring to, was the first like close death I had in my family. And I was 13 years old. So obviously, right in the the, the heart of puberty. So my hormones were raging and I just, it hit me really hard and I don't, there was nothing else in life that I could say that stuck with me harder than his death. Um, it was something I couldn't control. I had no power over it and I'll never forget it. So my first mission in, in the 75th Ranger Regiment was Operation Red Wings. So I had nothing combat wise to compare it to like trauma wise. So I think that's kind of how I related back. Well, and, and, you know, in talking about that, when, when you talk about how much that affected you, it, it was, it was so interesting to me that that's immediately what you went back to you get on the ground, you're looking around and that's what you go back to. And by all accounts, you know by now, or this is what we talked about kind of in the beginning, you know by now, or you think you know by now, everything that's going to happen in war, what war is going to be about. And if anything, this put it on its top. I mean, this was completely different than what you thought your first engagement as a ranger was going to be. You talk about going to battle and loving your country and loving war, and then you get there and you're like, war fucking sucks. I mean, that's... You, yeah. And and that's the thought that you have. And so 
like I said, your book is so different from other combat books because it doesn't talk about the blood and guts. It really is introspective about you and kind of the introspection of everyone that's around you. And so your grandfather again, does that give you strength? Because you don't go into a lot of detail about it, but does that give you strength when you're there or you knew, Hey, I couldn't control that. I couldn't control this. So I just got to get through it instead of, you know, taking a sucker punch again. Yeah, I think, I think it really did make it uh, a, a position of strength, really, because that was completely out of my control. My grandfather's death, you know, the timing, you know, he died of prostate cancer. It hit him really hard and really fast. Um, you know, he was with us at Christmas and then a few months later, he's on his deathbed. So to me, that was the same type of feeling I had about war was wow, I was just at Christmas with my grandpa uh, and now he's dead. Well, war, I thought was going to be glorious. Um, you know, I was ready to fight. I was a ranger. We were trained, you know, extremely thoroughly and we were ready. And I didn't get to use those skills. It was more, you know, you know, in between here is the only thing I could use. And so when you say you could only use what's in between here, it, it really doesn't turn out that way. Uh, yes, I agree with you. It initially starts that way. This is a thinking man's game. We've got to find these things. We've got to put these puzzle pieces in order to accomplish the mission and get out of here. But it really turns into a grit fest. Yeah, and it, you're right. It, it was, you know, very physically demanding. But um, I think... You know, a lot of guys will agree with me on this that have done these ridiculous missions or, you know, guys have done these ridiculous feats of strength or endurance that at the end of the day, you can only train so much, but you have to overcome what's between here. Because at the end of the day, you're always going to have that moment where, where the easy way out is, uh -uh, I'm not doing that. My body's done. And I had that moment multiple times, but quickly you snap out of it because you look at your buddies and your buddies are still driving on. So there's no quitting at that point. Well, let's talk about that because I, I wanted to introduce your grandfather because I wanted to kind of put it in perspective for you going into battle. But you talk about uh, training and you talk about training a, a lot in the book to kind of set this up and what you guys were doing. And you talk about a lot of different things. You talk about uh, RIP, Ranger School, being in the regiment. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting. I want for people that are listening, I, I think a lot of people know, but can you explain the difference between RIP, Ranger School, being Ranger tabbed in Big Army, and then being Ranger tabbed and scrolled in the regiment? Yeah, so... First of all, they're totally different. And, you know, when someone tells me they were a ranger, my first question is always uh, uh, tab or scroll, you know, because they're two different things. Um, even though we use the term interchangeably, I, I find them to be uh, one being, okay, you went to school. Let's just use an example of an accountant. So your accountant obviously went to school to learn accounting, right? And then they have to become licensed as, a, as an accountant. Well, just because you have an accounting degree doesn't make you an accountant. Like a CPA is different, different than someone with an accounting degree. And that's the way I look at Ranger and uh, far as RIP and Ranger School. Ranger Tab or Ranger School, um, which at the end of Ranger School, you get your Ranger Tab is a school that's open to everyone in the army. Um, actually, I think there's, I believe it's, is it E4 or above? I don't even remember anymore. Four. I know the only people that are privates that, are, yeah, the only privates there are from the Re Ranger Regiment. Everyone else is right, right. Uh, higher rank. Right. But it's open to the entire army and it's a leadership school. It teaches you small unit tactics and with the element of we are gonna starve you and not let you sleep in order to simulate the wartime environment. Uh, basically, we're going to stress everybody out and make you lead them into do some tasks. 
so that's ranger school and it's not easy <laughs> um it's a difficult school so it comes with a lot of pride and honor and you know everyone looks up to anyone with a ranger tab well rip a ranger indoctrination program is the old course that was required in, in, to get into the 75th ranger regiment and basically that's a, a shorter course but much more physical uh, it's a, it was a four-week course basically where they try to break you down physically uh, as fast as they possibly can and see if you're mentally tough enough to be part of the 75th ranger regiment and ultimately half a class that starts won't make it and that's every time so ranger indoctrination program when you pass that you are in, you get assigned to one of the three ranger battalions so you're serving as a ranger versus just getting the tab being called a ranger very different again both awesome accomplishments so that's that's the main difference um you don't you to, in order to get the ranger t ranger scroll that only gives you time in the regiment in order to earn your ranger tab so basically everyone from e5 and above in the 75th ranger regiment uh, is required to have a ranger tab so essentially when i ask someone you know if you're a ranger and they, they say yes the reason i ask if they're in regiment or not is because they also have the ranger tab so then then it's a clear cut you know they did both right well i was hoping that you would bring up the thing that you say about it's like calling someone with an accounting degree an accountant it's not necessarily a slam right. you're just saying that hey you went to the no, school not at all we live the life uh and and you would agree there's a difference in the school and the life absolutely i mean the school's hard don't get me wrong it's an accomplishment you should be very proud of it you can call yourself a ranger all you want that's great i think it's awesome um but to me there's a difference because in ranger regiment every day you're you have to earn your right to be there you can be kicked out at any moment whereas in the rest of the army that's not necessarily the case well i was trying to think you know today i had heard a saying that one year in the regiment is like three years regular army <laughs> uh that wouldn't surprise me that's why i only did uh four years <laughs> <laughs> i was bur I, I was pretty burnt out after four years and I, I mean i'm not the toughest guy in the world i won't even try to sugarcoat that but i'd say the guys that stay there for a career don't don't mess with those guys <laughs> Those guys are different. <laughs> let's just put it that way. Well, let's talk about that for a minute because you 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 mentioned that in the pretty much the last chapter of the book, and you start talking about things, and it, it was strange to me because it almost seems like some of them are insults until you really think about it deeply about what you're saying. And an example that you use is some of these guys in uniform. They rise through the ranks fast. They know how to do everything. But out of uniform, you wouldn't trust them with your kids, your wife. They never make the right decisions on the outside. And they they just seem to excel in that life and, and only that life. And then you talk about guys like you that get out, realize there's another world. And then there's the guys that do well and then do well on the outside, too. They just kind of flow in between the two. What was the reason for putting that yeah. in there? Because when I heard it at the end of the book, because I was going back and forth where at home I was reading it, and then when I was driving, I would listen to it. And it, it was it, I was driving, listening to that part, and I was like, wow, I can't believe, because it's almost, it's almost <laughs> like a calling out of yeah. people. It, I mean, I, I, it really is. I mean, it's saying to me, uh, my, the reason I put it in there, is to basically tell guys, you know, you could be the best soldier in the world, but that doesn't make you, that doesn't give you the right to be a chump outside of uniform. Because we all know, we see stuff on the news all the time where so-and-so, you know, 20-year veteran does this stupid thing. You're like, what the heck's wrong with you, man? You know how to do the right thing. Like, what, where did, where did 
you being a civilian now change that, that you now you can't, you can't operate. Yeah, that that was my whole point. Yeah. Is that, you know, it's kind of a calling out of all veterans to say, hey, we can do better. Well, and I, I, I think you're right there. You look at it in law enforcement. Um, sometimes we're our own worst enemy in law enforcement. Um, you see, and that's exactly right, where you know how to do the right thing. Why are you not doing the right thing? And, and so without us kind of checking ourselves, but you also have to worry. You, I, I know you had to avoid putting that in there. And I don't mean like you lost sleep over it or anything like that. But I know as you're writing it, you have to be thinking like, man, is do I want to do this? Do I want to cross this line in the sand? Or was it, did it come pretty easy? Because for a lot of people, that's a hard line to cross over. You know, I, I respect all veterans. I love you all. But, you know, like I said, I have those moments where I'm like, what the heck were you thinking? Like, you make us all, I mean, there are people out there that make these some of these decisions that make everyone, all of our veteran community look bad. And to me, that's one of the worst things is when I hear uh, the headline of some awful incident and it's US Army veteran. And it, that's the way it starts. So instantly I'm like, oh, great. But, but I think you would agree. What happened? I, I, yeah, I think you would agree, Tony, that a lot of that, just like with law enforcement, though, that's sexy. That sells. I mean, that doesn't necessarily have to be a part of the news, but that's going to grab the headlines if they say something like that. 20-year veteran or 20-year law enforcement veteran or first responder or whatever it is, that's going to get people to look up and go, oh, I better pay attention to this one just so I can. Because it's almost like people... People want people to fail at certain points in life. People want people to fail. I mean, and, and so that frustrates me about the me media and about putting these news out because you're exactly right. That's what they lead with. 20 year veteran. They don't say what happened. They don't say this. They say 20 year veteran because they know that's going to snatch the headlines. You got it. And my thing is just don't give them that opportunity. You know, obviously things happen, right? Like you had, um, oh my gosh, Eddie Gallagher on there recently. Yes. Like that guy, that guy got dragged through the mud. Like, let's be honest. Did he make all the right choices? Probably not. But did he get dragged through the mud? A hundred percent. Like he was, they made an example out of him and it was purely because of his pedigree. That's it. And I think he, he knows he will, he'll be one of the first ones to admit that yeah, he made he made some questionable decisions. We all do under the heat of the the moment, but ultimately he, he was doing his job. Like, yeah, I I agree with you. It's and, frustrating. And, yeah, and talking to Eddie uh, when you mentioned that, yeah, you're you're exactly right. He will tell you, and that's what I really enjoyed about uh, talking to him and having that conversation with him was when I first approached the subject of thinking about talking to him. I thought, and just like I told him, you know, hey, I wonder if this guy is going to just say, you know, I'm a perfect angel. I haven't ever done anything wrong. And he breaks it down in the first chapter of his book and tells you right up, look, I am no angel. I'm no this and I'm no that. I think that's another thing that we've kind of gotten away from. We're so worried, like I just said, about saying that we messed up or or taking it, that it it almost ends up where it becomes like a... I don't know, like a scarlet letter to wear around if you mess up and, and no one will ever forgive you for it. And I don't think that's right either though. No, no, absolutely not. Um, I, I actually talk about this in my book that one of the things that frustrates me more, most about, you know, how civilians look at the military is the only time that we're news and you probably are, the bell's ringing already. The only time we're news is when we mess up. Yeah. Like, that's it. That's the only time it's in the news. It's not not that we fought a 20 year war with, you know, only, you know, this many negative things. It's like every time a negative thing comes up, it's that's the headline. Yeah. So that that's one of the most awful things about the past 20 years to me is that we've treated the military as if you're only as good as that air conditioning unit. Right. No one cares when it's working. 
because it's supposed to work. As soon as that thing fails, everyone's cursing at it. Oh, that thing it's brand new. Why is it not working? <laughs> well, know? and and I um, think you mention it in a couple different ways in the book. It's not just the media or messing up. You you talk about it when when you're speaking about um, the the troops that were killed, uh, the mission that was at hand, and then some other people dying. You said, "Is anyone even going to know about this?" And if they are going to know about this, do they even care? That was a big question that you had throughout the entire book. Do people even care what's going on? And I want to talk to you about that a little bit because it seemed to really strike a chord with you in the book. Like it was a very emotional thing for you to write because you wrote about it multiple times. Does anybody, and it feels almost like you had that thought a lot while you were in country and stuff was, does anybody even care that we're over here doing this? You know, I still, to this day, that, that thing, that makes me mad when you say that. Because, you know, we fought a 20-year war and it's old news. It's already old news. Like, the only people who care are the people that were damaged. You know, I think the average American, to be honest, and I still feel this way, uh, they don't care about Afghanistan. They don't care about our 20 year war. Um, and I may be wrong, but I certainly don't hear that much about it until, you know, obviously there's a political reason to talk about it. Well, um, the only people who really care are the veterans and their families. Okay. Well, let me ask you then, if you think that way, why do you think that is? You know, it's a good question. And I think there's there's multi, probably multiple areas that you can address here. And I think um, one is we, we don't teach our kids enough about this stuff because, oh, we're not going to talk about violence. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I teach my kids all the time about war and, you know, what it means to serve your country. Um, and I'm very proud of this. I'm going to my, my daughter, she probably will listen to this. She's only four, but right now her favorite song, and this was not me planting it. She heard it one time and she said, that's my favorite song is God bless America. And to me, that's like one of my biggest wins as a parent so far is just by telling her how, how important it is to uh, honor the people who have served our country. Um, it's, it's carried on to my four-year-old and I, I'm actually very proud of that. <laughs> well, in talking about that and, and saying that that's a big thing that they use, at least when I went to basic and stuff, that's how they get you all revved up and ready to go to basic as they show you these films and they, they play the music and get everything going. My question to that is though, why do you think we've gone so far to the right now? Now, I'm not talking about people don't care about the war that's going on. Why do you think we've gone so far to the right where even the the military is changing at almost a cellular level what they're training now, what they're teaching now, the way they're teaching it, the way that schools and basic happen? I, I had a guy on here that worked at one of the the training areas and they, they don't even call the defect the defect anymore. It's like the army cafe or the army restaurant or something. They can't even call it that. I, I, I wonder from you coming from a unit like that, where you did your time, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Why, why are we to that point? And do you think, because I think it is, do you think it's going to swing back in the other direction? Oh, absolutely. And I think it does this, I mean, if you look at history, uh, the 90s were basically what we're experiencing right now. And uh, I think it's a little more extreme this time around. But, you know, we're transitioning into a non-wartime military. And essentially, there's a bunch of officers, and I love officers, so don't get me wrong. But there's a bunch of officers who don't have anything to do anymore, except for create new things new policies, new, new fancy terms. Um, they, they've got to find a way to make a name for themselves. And uh, the best time to do these types of things is non wartime. So I think this is a natural 
cycle, but it is very, very disturbing to watch being someone who served in a hundred percent wartime, you know, two wars, we were in two wars when I was in. So the only thing that mattered was winning. Yeah, it's not like that anymore. Well, let's talk about the unit that you were in. So you go to the Rangers and we talked about already, and we'll get into it more as we get into the actual mission, but you, you thought you knew what uh, war was going to be like. And I would say you even thought you knew what it was going to be like when you got to the Rangers. And even that kind of threw you for a loop. It wasn't what you thought. And the reason I bring it up is because you have a chapter called Two Deaths and a Unicorn. Of course, we'll mention the unicorn because she's mentioned throughout the book. But the two deaths that we talk about right when you get there, upon arriving to the regiment, PFC Nathan Stahl is killed by an ID blast. The the It goes into lockdown so that no one can send out. They can notify the family. And immediately in the book, you're talking about like, what the, I just got here. What is going on? And I, I want to talk about your mind state on that, just that as you get there and you think it's going to be this great thing and it's going to be, you know, the way you have it planned. And then it's completely in the other direction. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of respect for any, everyone that serves in the 75th and I still, to this day, think they're some of the greatest men on the planet, but I'll tell you what, um, I didn't expect ever and this is super naive, but I didn't expect us to lose anything. Uh, kind of invincible, kind of, that's how I felt. So when I first arrived and someone was killed in action, um, it was like a kind of a little wake up call. Like, yeah, this is, this is real life, bud. This is not uh, video games where you, you can just reset and start over and win. You know, it, it, we lose real men. Um, you know, I had, I had a little bit of that in basic training when Pat Tillman was killed, but this was much closer because I had, it was my first day at second Ranger battalion that that happened. So that was my greeting was, you know, a fellow Ranger dying in combat. So that so was pretty brutal. Did, yeah. So uh, how does that change your mind state then? Cause you go in thinking it's going to be one way it's not. Do you kind of switch gears? What do you do to kind of reestablish? Because the, in reading the book, that's what it felt like to me. You kind of had to reestablish your thinking. Yeah, it just took me from that, you know, that high of you just finished rip. You got your fancy beret and, you know, you're one of the, in one of the most elite fighting forces in the world to you, you better be ready. The shit's real. And I basically was grounded. I, I went from feeling like I was Superman, like invincible, you know, brand new private thinking he's <laughs> the hot shit and realizing that, no, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> you got to work for that, buddy. You got to work for it. So that's kind of, yeah, it did. It grounded me. It got me, gave me a good foundation to, to realize that this is, we're playing for keeps. Well, so you go into training, you, you, you start your training, but then the second death happens. And this one really kind of, if I can use it, goes back to your grandpa. This one sucker punches you too. And this is Pagero. Uh, he dies in training. Okay. Now it's different again for you because one, you see that it's real in wartime because your first day someone gets killed in action. This one was in training and and you talk about it in the book that you, how does this happen? It's training. How, how does this happen? We're not even at war yet. So I feel like you once again, shift gears and got to figure this out. Now at any time after you see this first death on your first day, Pagero happening after that, do you ever start thinking maybe this was a bad idea? Maybe this is too real, anything like that, or are you still, you know, steaming forward. No, I think it emboldened me. It just, it grounded me for sure. It taught me important lessons that I think, I think really ultimately protected me moving forward. You know, you know, their sacrifice was, it's, it was just that it was a sacrifice, but all of us gained from it because 
everyone learned lessons from that. And I wish it didn't have to be that way, but it better be that way or else they'll, you know, we don't want ever anyone to ever look and say they died in vain. Right now, I would never say that, but I would say that I learned so much from those guys, um, aside from the personal relationships, I think their death protected us, all of us that were involved in that uh, moving forward. Do you think that had anything to do with uh, your decision to do a right cross on someone that was uh, in training that kept messing up? Do you think that kind of emboldened you to that? Or do, do you think that stirred you at all? And of course, you know what I'm talking about. You're going through this guy keeps messing up, keeps messing up. Your sergeant tells you, you guys are going to pay for it. You give this guy a right cross to the face and he's gone the next day. Do you think it's because of those things that, that pushed you forward? Cause like you said, you weren't ever a bully. You were never a guy picking the fights, but on that day you definitely went for it. Yeah. I mean, I still to this day partially regret doing it because that's not my nature, but ultimately I did it out of love. I mean, I know it's easy to say, right? I did it out of love, but really it was for love of my fellow Rangers, right? I knew that this guy's mess ups is going to get somebody killed. If we, if we, if this keeps happening, it's not going to end well. So a sucker punch is nothing compared to what could have happened. So ultimately, yeah, I do think those two deaths, you know, weighed heavily on that moment of, you know, basically overflow with my cup uh, and everyone that was involved in that was like, man, I, I wanted to do that, but you know, I didn't. <laughs> so none people have actually thanked me. Um, and others just silently kind of gave their approval without actually giving their approval. So let me ask you then say that death doesn't happen. Say Pagero doesn't die. Uh, I want to play devil's advocate. You say you've, you've, yep feel bad to this day, but Piquero doesn't die in training. You still do that same action or do you think you're more reserved? I don't know. I think my nature is more reserved. Um, but I do think it did have an impact for sure. Uh, I, I knew that we were playing. I mean, this guy was brand pretty, pretty new. Like he was newer than me. He was the youngest guy in my squad and I had already seen two deaths. So he hadn't seen any. So I think part of that was absolutely lesson learned. I'm not going to be a part of this happening again in the back of my head. That's probably what I was thinking. Um, it was a very uh, lizard brain moment for me, but it was also a long deployment of training and training and training. So. Well, let's talk about that deployment. So you go, you are, guys are set up to go on a four month deployment. Um, you go over there, your first thoughts, like we talked about killing the enemy, killing the enemy, getting into it. Um, and then you guys sit around for about three months training, not really sitting around You're training, but you're, you're not really going outside the wire. You're not really doing patrols, anything like that. That was another interesting part of the book to me was that there's really not a lot of action. This story is more cerebral in thinking. There's not really a lot of action. There are things that happen in this book. Did you write that purposefully like that? Or is that just the way it was? Because I have to think over there, there's got to be a little more action than the way you put it in there. But this was really more of a cerebral way of looking at war. Yeah, you know, I, I did write it like that on purpose. Um, I, you know, I, I read a lot of war books and they're great, but I feel like every war book, you read the battle scenes and you're like, all right, bud, I've been in some firefights and I know how they go. It ain't like that. Um, now that's not to say that some of them aren't like that, but I, I've always felt like most books out there were too Hollywood. They weren't real enough. It's like, yeah, you talk about all this combat you're in, but what'd you do in between there? We all know what it is. 
Like, listen, there's a lot of war heroes out there. And there's a lot of amazing dudes that have done way more things than I could ever even imagine. But even they will tell you, oh, yeah, there were times when I was bored out of my mind. And, and I think war is more than just the combat. It's the preparation for combat, the, the stuff in between combat that really talks about what we do and what makes us, you know, a cohesive unit. Like uh, some of these firefights that I was in, in Ramadi, they lasted seconds, but in a book, you can drag that out for like 50 pages if you want to. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? absolutely. So, so I just wanted this to be a little more, again, cerebral and kind of more about the, the humans and not necessarily about the war, if that makes any sense. No, 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 absolutely. And and so when you guys are training and you're talking about going to the gym two and three times a day and you guys are just like ready to go, you say at one point you guys are so bored that guys are just getting out cots and setting out in the sun and sun tanning so that they'll look good whenever they get back and can say they were in Afghanistan. <laughs> And finally, yep. the call comes down. Someone runs by, tells you there's a bird down uh, to grab your guys and go. You go to the mission. You find out that everything that has happened, um, everyone gets spun up, gets all their kits ready, gets loaded. You head out in to the mission. You're almost there. You're told it's simply too dangerous after three months, and you're turned around. You're feeling let down. It's your first mission. You, you got to talk about, you got to walk us through what you're feeling there because it seemed like how you wrote it was just like build up, build up, build up, boom. And it's all over and it's never even gotten started. Yeah, it was just utter disappointment. I mean, you, you look at the, the, if you look at the lone survivor, the, the whole movie, right? All that had happened up until the rescue, you know, the, the recon team had been compromised. Everyone had been killed. Turbine 33 comes in to rescue them, had been shot down. We don't know if there are any survivors. That's when we were supposed to go help them out. So to us, we're thinking, you know, recent history at the time had said, oh, this is, this is Robert's Ridge all over again. Roberts Ridge was a similar situation where you had Navy SEALs and Air Force pararescuemen basically pinned down on a mountain and a helicopter full of Rangers was coming to rescue them. And it was eerily similar. So to find out that, oh, it's too dangerous. I mean, to us, that was like a huge insult. Like, really? These guys aren't worth it? Uh, and that was most of our initial thoughts was, you got to be kidding me. We don't know if these guys are alive or not. What if they're alive? What are we doing? And the call came down that, you know, we were turning around because of weather. The weather didn't permit the bird to get close enough. And they were worried about a bird going down because of weather. So that was very disappointing. And all of us were pissed off. I was, I was incredibly frustrated, uh, mostly because... Uh, I, I was thinking about what it'd be like if I was one of those guys that was still out there, not knowing, you know, knowing that my brothers were coming on one hand, but also like, what the heck's taking them so long? So uh, you would imagine how frustrating that would be to know that you've got, you know, some of your brothers on this mountain and you, they're being told you can't get there. Well, and, and so you're told that you can't make it in. Uh, you're going to come back, um, and then Mission 2 gets spun up. Uh, I call this uh, Mission 2 Redo. You're headed there. You guys are going to fast rope in. This time, they're, they're going to make it in. Uh, you go in. You fast rope in. Uh, not only do you see, you know, kind of your first... <laughs> I mean, this is your first combat that you're going in. You're fast roping in. You come in. It's dark. You got to go through uh, fog and all this kind of stuff. You hit the ground. You look around. Uh, your combo guy comes down. He's coming down so fast on the fast rope that he breaks his arm um, coming in. There's kind of chaos on the ground. 
you don't know what's going on. You know that a bird's been shot down. You know that there's multiple casualties already because you guys were told that this was probably going to be a recovery mission, not a rescue mission. Um, let's talk about that. So as you come in on your second one, you've explained how you felt on your first one. Let's talk about the second one. As you come in, you hit the ground and all right, you got your wish now. Be careful what you wish for because now you have it. Yeah, I mean, first of all, the 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 rope in was a complete shit show. I mean, we were looking looking out the back of a Chinook into a foggy, like black fogginess. You couldn't see anything. Uh, the guy at the head of the rope, the rope master, looked down, and he looked for that chem light to make sure that the chem light was because basically you stack two temp chem lights, and when it's on the ground, you got two chem lights next to each other. And you can see that from above. And he looked down and he just turned around, looked at us and, you know, shook his head at us. Uh, none of us knew what that meant. <laughs> um, ultimately, he couldn't see the chem lights because it was too foggy. But being a ranger and, and knowing that the mission was more important than possibly falling a few feet off of a rope, in his estimation, uh, he just went for it. And we all went for it. And thankfully, the rope was on the ground, barely, but it was. And yeah, we, it was complete chaos on the ground. We get to the ground and we were from there, we try to determine which route do we take to get to this crash site? Because we had multiple possible landing spots for the rope and we didn't know which one was going to be used. So we had to figure it out when we were on the ground. And thankfully, we had some pretty amazing guys as our point men, uh, Sergeant Condi was one from third, third, uh, platoon. And he, he basically oriented us to the, to the, uh, GRG or the satellite imagery because we didn't have maps, no maps. We were, we were doing everything on the ground with satellite imagery and we couldn't see the terrain. So he was trying to make a route to this crash site without being able to tell the terrain. Uh, after action report says, bad move, <laughs> really bad move because we had to move about three miles uh, is what we, we determined. And it was three miles and probably you know, 15,000 feet of elevation gain, uh, if not more, probably maybe double that because we were going straight up and then straight down and then straight up and then straight down and then straight up and then straight down. And you look on the map, you know, it's taken two hours and we gone half a mile. <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't going well on the ground. Let's put it that way. All of us were beat to hell, but it didn't matter. I mean, it, we've all trained for this stuff. You know, anyone in the military could physically do this stuff. So it was nothing, nothing new there. But the mental, you know, we've got guys that could be alive thing really was a huge motivating factor saying, you know, we got to get to our boys. We don't know if they're alive or dead, but the longer we take, the less likely they're going to be alive. So that's what we we're going. It was like a ticking clock. Well, that's kind of my question because you, you, as you go in, they tell you it's going to be a 12 hour mission at most. Don't bring food, uh, bring water, plus up on ammo, all that kind of stuff, uh, the, the main things. So as you come in, you go a half mile in two hours, immediately command or whoever is in charge right there has to be thinking, this is not going to turn out the way. Are you guys all thinking that immediately or are you just pushing forward and, and we'll figure it out at the end? Uh, no, I mean, I, I was the, I mean, this is my first mission. I thought this was normal shit. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is how this goes. This is not cool, man. <laughs> this is not what I expected. So yeah, I had no clue. I mean, I, I looking back on it, I'm like, wow, that was a completely insane compared to, you know, the 60 raids we did in Ramadi, <laughs> totally different, all of them. And this was, yeah, this was hell. So is command saying anything right now? I know you're not knowing this because it's your first mission, but 
are you hearing any chatter now? I know everybody didn't have radios and, and that could be a problem. Um, but are you hearing any kind of chatter that, that, uh, this is going to take longer than expected because in the end it ended up where you had to get resupplied and all that kind of stuff. But right away, are you seeing that or, uh, is command just kind of just trying to find everybody and get this all together because what it seemed like from the book was everyone scattered. You're trying to organize, get to the crash site. And there seems to be things that maybe shouldn't have gone wrong that did by how you guys came in, how you guys landed on the ground and everything. So is it more of that and focusing on, or is it focusing on individual groups? Um, I think the command, at least the command on the ground was pretty steadfast and, you know, we're just going to get to this crash site. Uh, the terrain's not what we thought. Um, yeah, we knew it's on this mountain, but it's definitely worse than we expected. But ultimately there's, I think the timeline was still, they still thought we could accomplish this much faster than ultimately we did. Um, there was still a lot of unknowns and on the ground, our, our, all we cared about was getting our boys. I mean, that ultimately, that's it. The timeline didn't matter. So when you finally get to where you need to be and you kind of look out of the expanse of it, first thing that goes through your mind? Uh, when we got to finally, you're talking about the crash site? Yes. Uh, the first thing that went through my mind was uh, that doesn't look like a Chinook to me. All I could see was a little glow from a fire and a little piece of the rotor. And if you've ever seen a Chinook, which I'm sure you have many times, they're huge. And I've ridden on them. I rode in one on the way to this mission and I'm 150 meters away and I can't see it. I'm looking right at it. I still can't see it. So I was still trying to process what the heck's going to be up there when I walk up to this thing. Uh, certainly doesn't look like a Chinook to me. And then ultimately in the back of my mind was when I get there, who's going to start shooting at me and where is it going to be coming from? Because it took us you know, over 24 hours to get here. So they had plenty of time to set up a really awesome ambush on us. So that, that's ultimately what I was still thinking about is, okay, we're about to get it on. Uh, where are these guys going to come from? And that was a big thing. And you, Go ahead. Yeah, and and to me it was like, I don't, I, it doesn't look like anyone's alive. There's no one moving. Maybe they're all eating, I was hoping. But there was no movement up there. So that wasn't really a good thing. Now, a couple of the facts that were out, you had transponders going off. Now, that could mean a couple of things. One, that there was actual live troops on the ground or that the people that had done everything they had done to the SEALs and to the Chinook were actually setting up a trap for you. Like you said, they were going to set up an ambush. They were going to get it on as soon as you got there. As you're coming in, you don't see any movement. You know that there's still a transponder out there. You think that this attack but it's kind of eerily quiet. There's nothing moving. And that shocked you in the book was there's not even like bad guys moving around. Like it looks like there was a fight and then everything disappeared from the earth. And it's gotta be eerie walking up to that because there's nothing there. Yeah, it was, I mean, the eeriest thing ever. I mean, obviously this huge Chinook just got blown out of the sky the whole entire mountainside had been on fire and it's, there's no sound. There's nothing. No one's moving. I don't hear any rustling of people trying to get our attention. I don't see any lasers. I see nothing. I hear nothing. Like what the heck is going on here? This is not right. <laughs> like all of us felt that way. This is something's not right here. So as you guys move into it, you figure out, okay, the bodies are here. Now, something that you said in the book that really struck me, you said as you went up to look at some of the bodies that were on the ground, it looked like they weren't even hurt. 
There was no trauma to him. There was no bullet wounds. There was no nothing. Uh, and as you go up, of course, you have to go through. You have to check them. You have to see if they've been rigged for explosives or anything like that. It really slows down the amount of time that you have to look at this person. And what I mean by that is it really makes you have to stare at these people. This is your first images of war. So once again, I go back to ask you, you thought you were just going to get it on. You said now even that as you walk up, you're like, okay, there's a crash site. They've waited on us. We're about to get it on again. And then it turns out to be your first job is to just stare at these guys and get them loaded into body bags, check them for explosives. So once again, it has to get into your head like, okay, this is not what I expected this to be. Yeah. I mean, there is never a single training that we did. Not even, a, not even a slight mention of anything like this. Like your first mission, uh, you know, this could be, you know, the cleanup of a horrible battle. This could be you only seeing dead Americans. No dead enemies. None. That was never even a consideration, either in training, in my thought process. You know, we're, we're America, we're the strongest military in the world, and we don't lose, right? I mean, that's what most of us believe when we go overseas. And all I was seeing was death and destruction on our side. And that was, yeah, it was definitely a, another reality check in my life of, yeah, these are real Americans and these guys gave the sacrifice. They weren't just a name on a wall or in the newspaper, like they're right here. And you can't do anything to help them. You're completely helpless once again. So your thoughts on the enemy, I want to pose that question to you because I know we all know what your thoughts were going into it, but I don't think there was a, a, a hatred going into it. You were just defending your country. You were doing what you were supposed to do as a ranger. It's, it's got to make a turning point right here about the enemy with you. And I want to know what you're thinking about the enemy. Now you see what they can do. You see the carnage that they leave behind very first mission out of the gate, you see how bad these people can be. How does your thoughts about the enemy change right then? Uh, I think at that point it was, again, not really a hatred, maybe a little, but mostly, uh, again, grounding you, making you think, these guys know what they're doing. Again, this is not America wins every battle. This is not the video game where you can, you know, reset and do it over so no one dies. These guys know what they're doing. They're professionals and you better respect them and you better, better be ready to fight. So that's, that's the mindset I took from there is I'm ready. When the, when the bullets start slinging my way, I'm, I'm not taking you for granted. I know you know what you're doing. And I think uh, most guys that have been in a firefight in Afghanistan would probably agree that these guys aren't amateurs. These guys have been fighting their whole lives. Iraq's a different story. You know, I, I was in firefights there. But Afghanistan, not amateurs. So when you're doing this, you're loading up. It takes a while to do that. You've got to move the bodies up up to the hill. But then you get another mission, and, and this was strange to me. Word gets around the group that, hey, this major that was with, uh, I think he was with the 160th, uh, he is recently married, and we want to get his ring back to his wife. But they can't find the ring. So they tell you, hey, guys, there's burning wreckage out here. Uh just go and sift through it as best you can and try and find this ring. And you, you amazingly put in the book, like, okay, that's the mission now. 
and it's so funny to me because how these missions are changing for you. Like, okay, now our mission's to find a ring. Okay, now our mission's to move up this hill and put this here. <laughs> uh, once again, not what I thought I would be doing. But you guys, everybody goes and looks for this guy's ring. And it, it was amazing to me, the teamwork and just the, the, the singularity cause that they were going for just to find a ring. Like, it could have been very easy to just walk away from that and go, we couldn't find it. I mean, really, it, it that is yep. finding a needle in a haystack, literally. But everyone got in. Yeah. I, and it almost became a competition. <laughs> yeah, that's everything in the in the 70th Ranger Regiment is a competition. So that part is kind of tongue-in-cheek as far as the competition part. That's normal. Everything we did in the regiment is a competition. I mean, if you're going to the Porta John, you guys are competing on who can put a bigger one in the Porta John. So <laughs> that that part totally normal. But yeah, this was not something you would expect, especially from a bunch of uh, infantry special operators. But you got to remember, at the time we finished recovering these bodies. Um, there was no follow on mission at that point. It was mostly uh, wait for guidance at that point. And our morale was pretty low. You know, all we had seen is obviously destruction. And we had no good news. So I, I think in, in my heart that uh, the guys on the ground, our leadership, saw an opportunity to, to give us a win. And plus, we, you know, all we were doing is pulling security anyway. Why not? What do we have to lose here? And a lot of people knew this guy and they had a connection. My commander uh, knew him from West Point. So it, he was one of us. Let's put it that way. You're talking the about. least we could do finding that ring. You're talking about Captain Work knew him from uh, West Point. Correct. Captain Work. New hit, new uh, Commander Reich from West Point. So you guys go out. Someone finds the ring. Um, how many hours are we into mission now? Man, at that point we are roughly twelve hours. Okay, into so. The mission. Technically, you're at index right now, or what should have been index at, at the 12 hours. How's everyone looking on food? Uh, of course, everyone had ammunition because there really wasn't. And even when you saw some troops coming your way, they got dealt with quickly from the sky. So uh, everyone's plussed up on ammo. Everyone's good, but water should be draining very low. And then no one really has any food. So how are we looking on supplies right now? Yeah, I mean, all the ammo in the world is on our backs. We still had body <laughs> armor. I mean, just the fact that we wore body armor into the walk, uh, on the walk into that, was just idiotic. I mean, we look back on the after action, we're like, yeah, we're definitely not going to be carrying body armor when we're trying to traverse these mountains again. <laughs> that was a mistake. So we dropped our body armor. Uh, we mostly kept the ammo uh, because we were feeling pretty light after dropping those plates but most of us were near out of water no food and we thought at that moment we were basically just waiting for uh, exfil not much else to do we really didn't get much more info except shortly thereafter that's when we got news that, oh yeah, and by the way, there's still a four man reconnaissance team out there. Go find them. Well, and, and let's add on another part of that. Not only do you find out that there's another reconnaissance team out there, you guys have downloaded, but SEAL Team 10 shows up uh, or parts of SEAL Team 10 shows up. Now, I want to ask you about this because when I read it, it, I, I'm, I don't know that the word is confusing to me, but you see these guys show up 
And they immediately go to the body bags and start going through them, checking the soldiers that are over there, um, checking for stuff that's on them. And I, you never say that you're angry and you say they got to do what they got to do. They know what they're doing. But I got to be honest, it, you write it almost like you are angry that they're doing it. And and you say over and over, like, I, I know they, they know what they're doing. That's their guys. They're supposed to be doing what they're doing. But like I said, you seem to write it almost angrily. Will you please explain that to me? I, I'll be perfectly honest. I was angry. Uh, I I didn't understand it. Um, I was trying to process why this was happening. And I, I just kept thinking, okay, if this was my guys, what would I do? I'm like, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> why are these guys doing this? And I just kept going over that in my head trying to figure out what what the thought process was and i'm sitting here watching it and it was it was extremely frustrating for me and i know it was for a lot of people over the years i've talked to most of the guys that were out there multiple times and all of us were disturbed i've never talked to the seal team tim guys and you know, like to process that so i don't i don't know i don't know what was going on or why they were doing it. I know it was emotional for them. You know, they lost a bunch of guys in, in, in an instant. So maybe I would have done the same thing, but yeah, I, it, in the moment I was angry. Uh, it felt wrong to me, but that was just my perspective. You know, like I said, they weren't my guys. Well, let me ask you then. So, you don't go into a lot of detail about it. You, you, you describe this scenario, but what was it that they were doing that was so offensive? I, I, I almost took away from it that it was offensive because you guys had given all the honor and reverence to load these guys, take them up there and do uh, what needed to be done to get them out of the area. And then these guys come in who had nothing to do with that and not really take over the scene, but just kind of do whatever they need to do. And they're ready to move out. They're going to load them and go. Um, what was it that they were doing that was so disturbing to everybody? You know, I honestly, I, I still don't have an answer. I, I, you know, we took, we held them with kid gloves. You know, we were respecting them as if they were still alive, you know, respecting their gear. And it felt to us from the outside again, that, you know, they were going through the baggies of their items. Like, I, it just didn't feel right to me. They were checking their pockets and stuff we'd already had to do. Um, I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't know the situation. I don't know if they're looking for letters that they knew they had or some mementos that they knew the family wanted. Like, I have no context. All I have is what we felt and what all of us have talked about over the years is, it felt wrong. Um, but we'd also spent a lot of time with those guys, you know, loading them up and we were exhausted and we felt bad because, you know, obviously these are your buddies. We don't know you personally. So we didn't know it was almost like we're invading on a, like a family grieving over their dead loved one. And we were standing there watching it. It was just, it was very, it didn't feel good. Well, I think you describe it as those guys were, would be cousins to, if it was a ranger, it would be a brother. Those guys were kind of cousins. I, I think that's the way you describe it in the book. Am I right on that? Yeah. 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 So but obviously you're going to be closer to your brother than your cousin, right? A absolutely. But you're still, it's still family. You're still going to take care of it. What was amazing to me was after they go through this, they get it ready. X Phil is coming, except that it's only going to X Phil team 10 and the actual uh, 16 litters with them. Um, they loaded the helicopter and they were loaded themselves for X Phil in two minutes. Uh, that that's absolutely oh, ridiculously fast. Yeah. It's, it's unreal. And I thought maybe you wrote that wrong or, uh, that it got skipped over on the editor, but it literally took two minutes to load 16 litters and the entire team with them. Yeah. I mean, they had two or three guys on every bag 
and they ran in. Um, I think only a few of the team or a few of the guys had to come back to help. Like these guys were more fresh than we were. So for us to, for two guys to carry one body was very difficult. We were going up a cliff. They had a flat area, but it was only taking two or three of them. And they were running these guys in like they were nothing. And yeah, they were moving, they were moving fast and thank goodness because all of us were so nervous. I mean, this is the first time a bird has come back to the right. spot where they just shot one down. So everyone wanted that bird out of there, like as fast as they could go. Well, almost uh, the it was exact almost like spot, we were holding, right? holding our breath. Yeah. It was like less than a hundred meters from where the bird was shot down. And yeah, it was, all of us were holding our breath the whole time other than the seals who were carrying their buddies as fast as they possibly could. And yeah, they did a fabulous job getting out of there. And, uh, you know, it wasn't that you guys were there quietly either, because to get that landing zone and to get the helicopter in there, you had to set off explosives and knock down all the trees. So anybody in a, I don't know, 20 mile radius, 30 mile radius knew you guys were there. And it's amazing to me oh, yes. that that other than that small group that came that was dispatched by air, no one came poking around, really. No, I think uh, the force that had caused all this ruckus uh, quickly realized, like, oh, wow, we did something big here. Uh, they're going to send a lot of guys. <laughs> this is not this is not normal. This is not. This doesn't happen. And they, they were smart. They were not stupid. Like I said, these are not amateurs. These are well-trained, intelligent fighters. They got out of Dodge and they weren't coming back. Or if they were nearby watching, they knew better. They saw how many guys were out there. The helicopter takes off, gets away. You guys are given second missions. Now you guys are going to split from here. A team's going to go out and look for the four uh, SEAL recon team. And then your group is going to head to a JDAM site uh, and check that uh, this building was destroyed and the terrorist that was targeted in that building was also killed. Before we get into that story, because I actually think that that was uh, some of the most telling part of this book was this second mission, not the first mission, that kind of tested you physically, mentally, but this second mission, you literally thought you were going to die. But before we get into it, I want to talk about a couple of the people and I, I want to get your thoughts on them. And I want you to describe these people before, uh, we go out on the second mission. Okay. So I want you to talk about captain okay. work for a minute. Captain work. Uh, first of all, a mountain of a man, um, I hope I get his height right. I want to say six foot two. At the time, he was probably 240. And the guy could run 20 miles and he could throw you about 300 meters because he was the former middle linebacker for West Point. Um, everything he did was like with a hammer. <laughs> uh, he had the precision of a sledgehammer. And you never wanted to be in his way. You wanted him on your team for everything. Extremely intelligent, but he loved his men more than anything. Like of any commander I think I ever had, I'd say Captain Work would be the first one to jump in front of a, a bullet without a shadow of a doubt. He's the guy that to this day still calls and checks in on his guys that were there. Um, I've talked to him recently, so it tell, tells you his character. He, he really cares about his men and he's going to get any job done. He'll, he'll move the mountain if he needs to. So that's captain work in a nutshell. All right. Lieutenant English. Lieutenant English. Uh, he was not my platoon leader. He was a platoon leader of right. Third platoon of Charlie company. But I got to know him uh, after later in life. And he's a guy that's got the resume of resumes. If you look at a military resume, he was an enlisted man. They reached the rank of E8. 
and made it to the probably the most elite unit in the world, uh, CAG or Delta Force, and as an enlisted man. Yeah, that wasn't enough for him. He decided, I'm going to become an officer. And he ends up at the 75th Ranger Regiment as a platoon leader. And later he would become a Green Beret again as a military officer. And that's how he'd retire. But at the time he was a platoon leader, third third platoon. And everyone respected him, obviously. he, he Rarely do you get an officer that comes into the, with the pedigree of someone who's already been the highest level of special operator that exists. So he knew what he was doing. He's dealt, he's done some crazy stuff in, in the past. In fact, he wouldn't even talk about it. Uh, we asked him what he used to do and he, he would never, never divulge it. So one of those guys that he'll never take the credit for anything, but he will do everything. Highly respected the guy that everyone looks up to. So those are two of the guys that I had the pleasure of serving with. And they're, they're a couple of many, uh, ultimate warriors that I served with. Well, we're going to, we're going to talk about, uh, three more of them. Um, we're going to talk about Sir, Sergeant first class Congdon. Yep. So Sergeant first class Congdon was my platoon sergeant and served a very long military career and i don't want to go into too much detail but let's just put it this way he reached the highest level that you could reach in special operations and he retired there uh, he was shot and he recovered fully and ended up going back into service and, and doing more deployments after that uh, six foot three six foot four uh, again probably 230 pounds big dude very raspy, deep voice, completely covered in tattoos. Uh, probably the ultimate definition of an Irishman you could come across. Guy you don't want to meet in a dark alley. But again, another guy that you absolutely want on your team who actually cares about his guys. But he also expects you to be excellent at everything you do. So almost like when you looked at, looked at him, he was kind of like your father. Like... There's no, if, if the worst thing you could do is disappoint him or fail him. So we all looked up to him and, and tried to live up to his standard. Uh, Lieutenant Hal. Lieutenant Hal, gosh, one of the smarter guys that I've ever come across in, in the military. Yeah, you look at him, he actually kind of, kind of similar to me. He looks like a nerd. However, one of the one of the strongest and fastest runners that I've come across, like he would uh, in platoon competitions, he would always be near the top. But he would just kindly like s slip away and, and not take any credit for it. Uh, all of us trusted him. He was one of those platoon leaders that knew the value in his platoon sergeant. And he had one of the best in the in the 75th Ranger Regiment. So good for him to that he basically uh, lived under the, his umbrella. He made strong decisions, but he also, every time Congdon talked, he listened. So that's a very strong leader. He, he knew what he had around him. And the last person I want to talk about is your best friend, Hatfield. Yeah. Hattie, still my best friend to this day. He, uh, he was my roommate. Uh, my partner in crime, we spent basically every moment together, both in our squad and when work was done, we'd go hit the bars together, um, uh, and cause shenanigans out in Tacoma and Seattle The guy, basically he, he was like another brother to me and not just the term of like, you're my brother, like my actual brother. If I called him right now, if I pick up the phone and called him on this podcast and said, Hey, I need you to come up to Seattle. Uh, he'd pause and say, okay, next flight's in two hours. Is that fast enough? <laughs> um, that's just the type of guy he is and love the guy. Um, very similar to myself. He's probably a little bit faster and a little bit stronger than me, but we, 
We definitely got along and poked fun at each other constantly. We always made fun of each other. That was kind of our thing. So now that we've talked about all these people, we go out on this second mission. Now, Lieutenant English takes uh, his guys, and he's going out looking for the seal recon element. Ultimately, uh, he ends up finding them, uh, finds Latrell. And I thought it was interesting, the the conversation that they had back and forth when Latrell kept asking him, how many people did you bring? And he, being from the pedigree that he was, was like, wait a minute, why is he asking this? And and took all the precautions and everything and said, I brought enough and, and all those things. But he ultimately ends up uh, accomplishing his mission uh, and getting Latrell and getting him back out of there. The first question that I have about it is, do you ever think about you could have been on that mission or you could have been on the mission you were actually on? You wanted to get in the fight. You wanted to actually get a win like you talk about with an actual live soldier going to rescue him. Did it ever bother you that you were split apart? No, not at all. Um, we're, we're all, we all have a job to do. And, you know, I don't care that it was turned into a movie. I don't. In fact, you know, when I got home from this deployment, I'm pretty sure that none of us talked about it until it came up again when the movie came out. All of us kind of looked at each other like, wait a minute, this sounds familiar. <laughs> wait a minute, is that the mission we were on? I mean, that's honestly, that's how it happened. It was just another mission. You know, we were just doing our job. So, you know, I, I'm just happy he was found. I mean, that was to me, the, the icing on the cake was hell. Yes. We, one of them's alive and thank goodness we were moving around that mountain fast because who knows how long they would have kept him safe. Uh, I don't. I don't think they would have kept him safe forever. Well, and that's due to Lieutenant English. And you talk about how fast he moved his troops to to get him there, and they moved in an incredible amount of distance in a incredibly short amount of time. Uh, back to your mission. So you guys go for the J Dam site. You're moving, uh, going down, and as you're actually going into the, I think you called it the Valley of Death. As you're going into it, um, it is so the terrain is so bad that you're actually taking like two steps sliding, two steps sliding. You guys are moving through, uh, as it gets into nighttime, uh, rain starts to come in, but then it just turns into an unbelievable rain. Like you've never seen. And you actually say in the book that you thought you were going to die. You thought you were going to die of hypothermia, uh, because it got so cold so fast and with the rain. And uh, I bring it up because, one, I want to hear what you were thinking from you during this and as everyone's kind of freezing together. And then I want to talk about why I ask you about those guys because I want to talk about decisions that Captain Work made in order to keep you guys alive that night. Yeah, it's – it's um, yeah, to this day, I think that I was probably well on my way to dying – it, uh, it was over 100 degrees during the day, and we had been working all day. Um, the day before, at night, basically we didn't sleep the night prior. <laughs> we were supposed to sleep, but who's going to sleep after you've just, you know, carried a bunch of dead bodies and you're still out there? None of us slept. We go on this patrol. We're moving at ridiculous speeds, 100 degree weather, and it just starts dumping rain. And it starts really raining, like monsoon type rain. And you can't see in front of your face. You know, we had night vision. There's an, you couldn't see anything. And we got to the point where we were touching each other, hands on shoulders while we were walking. And it got to, I'm, I mean, I don't know the official number. I've done some weather research to determine what that was. And we think it was in the lower 50s in a matter of about two hours. So over a hundred to the lower fifties in two hours, we were overheated and we were already soaked with sweat. So the rain at first actually kind of felt good, uh, but quickly you start cooling off and you get soaked. 
And I got to the point where it was raining so hard and I was getting cold so fast that I, I couldn't move my arms. Like I couldn't, I was trying to maneuver on the ground to, to get to a spot where I was not getting rained on as much. And I had to like try to convince myself to move my arms. Like, okay, we're going to move my arms now. And I just couldn't do it. Like I couldn't even talk myself into it. And slowly, like I realized I, I wanted to scoot a little closer to the guy next to me and I couldn't get my legs to do anything. I'm just laying there. Like my brain's still functioning, but I can't move. Like my motor control is fading fast. So yeah, I started thinking, holy shit, I, I'm, if we get shot at right now, I don't know if I can do anything. I might be worthless. <laughs> And that's a weird feeling, right? I'm waiting for that fight. And here it is, <laughs> you know, I, it might be coming. And, and you're in that dream, right? The dream where you can't move. That actually happened. <laughs> that was a real thing. And I lived it. So I was struggling. I was, you know, I was shivering pretty hard. Teeth were chattering. You know, I couldn't move. The whole body was shivering. I was just hoping, oh, come on, rain's going to stop any minute. It's going to stop. And it just kept coming. It just kept coming and kept coming. So at that point, you, you talked about some of the guys who made a decision. So, you know, we're on the side of this mountain. We're heading down into this village that we just dropped bombs on. So I would assume that if there were enemy nearby and we didn't get them, they're pretty pissed off, right? You just dropped bombs on us. So they're probably ready to fight. And Captain Work, Lieutenant Howell, and Sergeant Congdon essentially came to the conclusion that there was only one option. We need to light a fire <laughs> in the middle of the night on the side of an open mountainside in Afghanistan, uh, a, maybe a mile and a half from three 500 pound bombs that we just dropped in the Korangal Valley. So if you're familiar with the Korangal Valley, it's the nickname is the Valley of Death for good reason. It was uh, one of the most deadly areas for the United States during the war in Afghanistan. So making that choice took some cojones. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, Captain Work, who is now I think general work had to make the choice, you know, do I need to risk security to keep my guys alive? And to him, it was a no brainer. I remember talking to him and he said, um, I remember that when I started feeling cold, like everyone here is half the size of me, I'm pretty freaking cold. <laughs> I'm shivering. Uh, got to do something. And he did, he made that decision and lit a fire. I couldn't even get up to go to the fire. I was that worthless. So I had guys literally lifting me up to, and once I got on my feet, I could walk, but I couldn't physically get to my feet. I stood, I'll never forget it. I stood in the flames. My feet were in the, in the embers and I'm looking down, making sure my feet aren't melting <laughs> and I could feel life almost coming back into my body at that point. It was the weirdest thing ever. Not to mention the steam flying off of me because I was so hot. But uh, I've told told work this. I've told I've said it on post many podcasts that I told him. I said I think you saved my life that day. I don't know if I would have been able to go much longer. And you know I've I've I can push myself pretty far, but I've never been to the point where I couldn't physically move. Well, I want to know how you guys got the fire started. And what you use, because it's still pouring down rain, right? So I wish I knew the complete answer. I only know parts <laughs> of the answer. So I know they use some of that satellite imagery. Um, and somehow either someone had some fire making device that that survived the rain. But I, I think it was a some type of waterproof lighter. Um, thank goodness someone had one uh, along with 
very little paper. But yes, it was still pouring rain. So you make it through the night. How many hours are we into this 12 hour mission now? So we're looking at probably 36 hours in at this point. Okay. You make it through the night, you're headed into the town. Um, they tell you, I, I want to kind of quickly go over the town because I, there wasn't that much. You found the building accidentally, uh, more or less because you looked at it and thought it was just tilled land, but it was actually where the J dams had dropped. Um, but you're supposed to get resupplied. Uh, you see the plane come over, drops two packages out. They don't go to the right place. They come, uh, they burn in, actually. I think both of them burned in, right? Uh, Destroy most of (laughs) what's on the pallet. You guys get some water. So you still have no food. You still have no water. You've got to be mentally just destroyed by now, especially watching these two crates burn in. Um, What do you tell yourself? That was over 48 hours. Right, yeah. So what do you guys tell yourself? Like, fuck. Now we don't have any food or water again. What are we going to do? You know, uh, most of us were pretty pissed off. But we're like, <laughs> yeah, what, what, what can we do about it? Not a damn thing. So I got a funny side story about that. One of the crates came into this huge cliff off this cliff. I mean, a huge cliff, probably... 200, 300 feet straight up and down. Huge. And we had some RRD guys with us. And there was no hesitation on this either. (laughs) This thing goes off the cliff and they can see it down on this little ledge about 200 feet straight down. And the RRD guys say, that's the pallet that has the dip. We're going to get it. And they rigged up their gear and they started rappelling down that mountainside to get their chew as one of the resupply items on that (laughs) pallet. Uh, Did they come back with food? Absolutely not. Did they come back with water? No. They came back with Copenhagen. Unbelievable. But that's, you know, that tells you a lot about those guys other than, you know, they're freaks of nature is one. And two, you know, we were running on pure adrenaline. Uh, food wasn't really, I don't ever remember being hungry. I was definitely thirsty, but food, I didn't, I didn't care for any food at that point. Well, it, it's an amazing story that you guys actually make it out of there. Um, the guy that you were actually trying to kill got away. He was killed later on. Um, but just that you guys get told, 12 hour, it ends up being almost three days. Um, Did you pack for kind of the final question of that? When you went out on missions from that point on, whether in Iraq, Afghanistan, did you pack on your own thinking or did you still pack mission plan? Uh, Always mission plan first. But I'll tell you what, I'll tell you a little secret. Okay. I always had extra food. I always carried extra food and I never would skimp on water from that point forward. Uh, if the mission called for, you know, they say, yeah, about six hours. I'm like, okay, so three days, got it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it never happened. It never happened again. Uh, I think the longest mission after that was a 24 hour mission we did in Ramadi, which is a, a plan to ambush that we did on a weapons cache, which was a really awesome mission, but, um, it was 24 hours. So nothing compared to this. I mean, this ended up being eight days. Operation Red Wings was eight days for us on the ground. Well, how long was it? It was three before you got food, water, resupply, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. The first resupply. And then we didn't get right. another one for a couple more days, Jeez, but, um, yeah, we, We essentially, I mean, I think I, my notes say that I ate two MREs. So I know I had two MREs in eight days and I I may have had a third that I didn't write down, but at the most it was three. And I may have had more or 
a little bit more than my team leader because he gave me some of his meal because I was looking a little thin. <laughs> uh, you got to love those MREs. Uh, I, I still love them to this day. I love the taste of them. I don't know if I'm dumb for that, but uh, I, I still love the taste of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, I respect them highly. You know, if actually I would say this actually taught me a lot about life. If you're going to complain about food not tasting right, it could be worse. It could be that you don't have food. And it's I true. think to, to this day, I'm the most non picky eater you could possibly imagine. My wife says he's a human garbage disposal. It doesn't matter if it tastes like crap. It's got calories in it. It's got nutrients in it. He's going to eat it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. I love Tabasco sauce from uh, MREs now. I still put it on a ton of food. Still put Tabasco sauce. I have like two or three bottles in the refrigerator right now of different kinds of Tabasco sauce. I, I absolutely still love it. So um, you get done with this. You come back home. You go on your date. You finally get the date with the unicorn. We didn't talk about it a lot, but you talk about it a lot in the book. Not necessarily talking to her. You were gone a lot, but thinking about her. You get her to talk to you. I won't say what happens with the unicorn because I want that to kind of, I want people to figure that out. What I want to talk about about you being back is you come back and you kind of get into a, a normal life. You get done with your service. You go back to college. But you have a completely different outlook than the first time you were at college. You respect things a lot more, um, and you just look at life differently. Now, what I thought was interesting, though, if you read the first part of your book, and when you talk about you went to the University of Arizona and you were part of the fraternity life and just kind of looking for the party and living that college life, when you come back and you see people living that exact same kind of life, you really don't understand it anymore. And I thought it was so crazy from the first chapter to the last chapter when you're talking about it and the complete change just in four, almost five years that you have gone through uh, and, and changed at a, you know, at a amazing rate in that four years that you just don't understand that anymore. Was it hard to adjust back? Oh, hell yes. I, every class I took, it was so funny. I, you know, I was only a couple years older than most of my classmates. I say I was five years older than most of them, right? So not that much older, but every class I went into, I, I promise you, I related more to the graduate student or the, the uh, professor than I did to my other students. I'd go to the office hours and you could tell they even treated me differently. It was like, I'm not talking to a kid anymore. I'm talking, talking to this crazy ass dude. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, I just, it was different. It was a different dynamic. I could relate to them much more. And I couldn't relate to the college kids anymore. Even though I was doing the very same thing they were doing. I think not only did I grow up a lot, I matured. And I had a much better respect for time because I knew that at any moment that could be your last. So there's no time to waste. Don't mess around. Yes, you can have fun, but why are you here? You're here to get your degree. You're not here to party. Yeah, if you go to a party, great, but you better do well. So I just the mindset was just completely flipped on its head. Yeah, after I got out, I, I did uh, much better. I had more respect. I remember sitting in one class in college, and and this guy sitting next to me, he was like, he was failing or something, and and I was like, bro, you you know, you gotta you gotta pay attention. He was like, ah, don't worry about it. If I fail, my dad will just pay for me to take it over again next semester. And it was it was crazy to me, like hearing something like that because I was by that time married and and. Uh, I'd been married for a while and was going to college, working a job. My wife was working a job and, and finishing her nursing degree and, and all these different things. It was just a way different atmosphere. But 
I, I don't think it was just different because I was older. I think it's different because I learned that it could always be worse. You know, you said that that life could end quickly, but I learned that it could always be worse. And 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 we've talked about it before. I was never uh, at at the time that I was in. I was never in combat, but just knowing what I went through and what I did in the military and and getting out and paying for my own college, I knew it could always be worse. And and I. I always wanted to think about that in my head. You know, that's what helped me kind of, hey, if you don't pay attention and you don't pass this, it's going to be coming out of your money to redo this. So it it uh, it changed my way of thinking about it. Now, you went on even further, got your chiropractic degree and um, have a successful business in Washington and, and soon to be coming to Texas, correct? You got it. Yeah, I'm actually in the process of selling my clinic here in Washington. And I won't get into the reasons why, but um, the big reason being I want a little bit more freedom. So we're moving to Texas. Actually, my family's already down there. They've been there for two months and I've been flying back and forth. And let me tell you, Texas is not Washington State. It, it, it is I'll leave not it at that. that. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's definitely not. As a matter of fact, you know, I'm based out of Texas. I went to Washington for vacation this year, and uh, you're right, it, they're not the same. Not not even close. Uh, I flew into Portland and went up to the beach in Long Beach, in Washington, and and you're right. Uh, it, it is a different way of thinking, and that's what amazed me about you when you and I first started talking after being in the military. And, and you mentioned it in the book. No one was real political or anything like that, but the way you spoke in the book and the way you wrote it, it always was strange to me that you lived in Washington. I thought that's like the craziest place that he could pick to live any part of that West coast, just because of your thinking, your philosophy on life and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it was, it was really weird to me that you said that that you live there now that you're moving to Texas, it makes a little more sense, but any reason why you picked that? Honestly, my whole life, I'm, I joke about it and I tell my friends, I'm a chameleon. Like I, I can fit in with any type of group. Right. Like I, I don't, I don't really care what anyone else thinks, you know, their beliefs. It doesn't really affect me until it does. And, and that's what this past couple of years has really taught me is that, you know, yeah, in the past that didn't matter, but right now it actually does. Um, because if you don't believe uh what they believe you know especially here in washington you are you're lower than than them <laughs> you, you you are that guy right and you're treated as such and i i'm not okay with that so this is the first time in my life where i've lived not lived somewhere that was pretty liberal and i've been fine like i've been able to get by I mind my own business. I do my own stuff until now, this past year and a half, you know, the, the whole COVID shutdowns and all that mm -hmm. really changed everything. It changed the game. I mean, now it's do what we say or you're not accepted in our society. <laughs> Got it? It's a little different here in that Texas. I think you'll it's come down to. Yeah, I think you'll get along well here. So what can we promote for you, uh, Tony? You know what? Um, obviously, I've got my book up there. I just want, especially the veterans watching this, to know that you know this this past year and a half has been hard for a lot of people. The end of Afghanistan has been hard. You got to look to your fellow veterans. I mean, I think this podcast is doing great things. You got to reach out to your fellow veterans and and meet up and you know stay connected because. Part of, part of the reason I wrote my book was to try to explain to people what it's like to connect with another human like we do in the military. And people that have been in know, like, you'll never have that anywhere else. I mean, yeah, law enforcement does have a brotherhood. You know, firefighters have a brotherhood. But the military is a little bit different. And, and I think it really comes down to one thing. You have a, a much higher calling you're in the military, you're not doing the job 
for just your own reasons. You're not doing it to, you're definitely not doing it to, to provide for your family. <laughs> I mean, we don't make that much money. You're doing it for your brothers and you're doing it for your country. And I think that one underlying like connection that you have doing it for your country, I think gives it a different dynamic. And not to mention, you know, at any moment we could be sent off to war. Well, I think you're doing so, great things. At the end of the day, reach out to your brothers. Yeah. You don't need to promote anything for me. <laughs> uh, you know, they they always say, uh, talk to your strongest friends uh, first. Those are the ones that, that uh, hide it the best. But we do want to promote the book because it's a fantastic book, Leave No Man Behind. You can get it pretty much everywhere. It's on Kindle. It's on uh, audiobook. It's on Amazon. You can buy it at at uh, websites on bookstores, and you can also buy it at drtonybrooksauthor.com. Now, if you want to learn more about Dr. Brooks here, uh, you can go there. It's got book, news, blog, store, keynote speakers. You can contact him. You can actually have him come and speak. Now that he's in Texas, enjoying his freedom, I don't know that he'll be available that much to speak anymore, but you can find it there. Uh, it'll give you all the contact information and how he can find you to bring you in for his group. Once again, that's drtonybrooksauthor.com. If you want more of me, you can find me on Instagram at the DTD underscore podcast. You can find me on Facebook at the DTD podcast. And you can find me on YouTube where all the video versions of these conversations are at the DTD podcast. Remember, guys, the best stories are true. And you come here every week because we give them to you. That's going to be the show for tonight. That's Dr. Tony Brooks. I'm DJ. This has been the show. We'll catch you guys on the next one. See you later. Bye.